humbled. I heard Brother Tenney say something one time. He said, uh, I'm going to repent for enjoying all those compliments and uh, going to hope that God forgives me. Uh, thank you, Matt. I love you, bro. So thankful for your friendship. Everything you just said, I could say the same about you. Amazing father, amazing husband. And thank you for letting me do this. These are uh, really cool opportunities. These are some of my favorite opportunities right here because the amount of potential that's usually in a setting like this to reach the world is just so humbling. You know, the only other opportunities that I feel like are matched to these are speaking at Bible colleges and speaking to PKs, different ones. There's so much reach in just this, this group meeting right here. And so I'm humbled to be a part of that. And I'm excited about what you're going to do in the end times. I was praying today about what to talk to you about, and I'm not, I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm not going to do any of that. I want to talk very practically. I felt a burden come on me this afternoon. I don't have any notes on anything like that. I just, I really want to drive something home in this, on this call that I feel like we need right now. We really need it to move forward uh, with what God is setting up the church for in this last hour. And that's wisdom. And I want to talk about that. Now, if you know me, uh, you know that I am attending school in Jerusalem and I am a big time Bible nerd and Hebrew uh, buff. Uh, my focus in college is linguistics of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And then I'm pursuing a second degree of cultural studies of the ancient Near East. And so I want to just kind of break down what the Bible is telling us, like the grand narrative of the Bible, which is obviously redemption. But let me show you something that you, you may have seen, um, you may not have. And if you haven't, then maybe you'll be enlightened on this conversation. But as you know, the Bible starts off in a garden. We can see that clearly. Um, it is starting out with God and humans in relationship. The word Adam, that's not a name, that is a word, it's Adam, it means human. And we see that God, after 52 verses of making creation, he looks and he finally says something isn't good. He says, man being alone isn't good. And so he creates for man, in the Hebrew, it shows that he rips man in half and tears a piece off of him and makes woman. And we give her the name Eve, even though in Hebrew, her name is Hava. You can look it up uh, if you've got a Bible app that looks up Hebrew words. Her name is Hava, which literally means life. And you can see that a little bit in English because in the Bible, it says that she was the mother of all living. So the narrative is set us up where God has spoken to a human. God gave human a command. Don't eat from that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil wasn't a bad thing. It was disobeying a command that was a bad thing. Okay. And so we see human has been given the word and Hava life. I'll just call her life. How about that? Life is enticed by the serpent and the serpent begins to speak to her and entices her. And the Bible says that she looks at the tree and she takes, I'm sorry if that was really loud. I'm in the front yard because my kids are extremely loud in the house. So now we got cars driving by that are even louder. So what are you going to do when you travel and you don't have a place to go? So anyway, but life listens to this voice, this, this demonic voice. And we just, we got to build this narrative. And she ultimately fails by listening to a voice. But you, what you're supposed to do in, in Hebrew is you collect words. There's not a ton of Hebrew words in the entire Old Testament. There's only 8,194 unique Hebrew words in the entire Old Testament. To put that into perspective, there's over 100,000 Greek words, different Greek words in the New Testament, which is a much smaller volume. So just to kind of help you out with how few words there are. So they use the same words over and over and over to retell a story. And so I want you to collect these words on this journey of the narrative. The Bible says that life looked at the tree, saw that it was pleasing to the eyes, and she took the fruit. And so we've immediately come to the conclusion that life looks and life takes. That's what life does. Not only does life look and life take, but this woman called life, life is personified as a woman in this story. She also wants the human to look and take. And sure enough, this human looks and takes, Adam, Adam takes the fruit and it goes haywire, okay? 
And we see this narrative just keeps on uh, reemerging throughout the Bible. In fact, it says in uh, Genesis 6, verse 2, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Genesis 12, 14. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, talking about uh, Abram's wife here, Sarah, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken. So we see this over and over and over again. We see it with Joseph. Potiphar's wife looked at Joseph. He was pleasing to the eyes, so she tried to take him. We see it with Saul. He was heads and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was pleasing to the eyes. The Israelites said, we want him. Let's take him. And we see this just over and over and over again. Life looks, life takes. And life was personified as a woman. So the grand theme of Genesis is a human going to listen to God or is this human going to listen to life? Unfortunately, we see the story that this human listens to life, which you remember the story. Life looked at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Remember, we're collecting words. We'll pop trivia real quick. You can turn your microphones off. If I got any Bible nerds on this call, I just want to kind of pull some knowledge out of you. Who else in the Bible came to an opportunity to get knowledge of good and evil? Can you think of somebody else in the Bible? Anybody? I'll give you a hint. It's in uh, First Kings. Solomon. Solomon. Same Hebrew words. Solomon has a dream one night, and God asks him, says, what would you have me do for you? And Solomon, which his Hebrew name's even funnier. Solomon is Shalomo in Hebrew, by the way. Just fun fact. Next time you guys want to preach on Solomon, try saying Shlomo from a pulpit and not busting out laughing. So Shlomo is asking God for the ability to discern between Tov and Ra, good and evil. Remember, Tov and Ra was not bad. Knowledge of good and evil was not the problem. It was disobeying the command of God that was wrong. And so Solomon asked for this, and God says, huh, that's interesting. The last time somebody had an opportunity for this, they just looked and took it. Now you're asking and you're, you're going to wait on me. I'll give it to you and I'll give you more. Finally, someone's not looking and taking. And God made Solomon the wisest man in the entire Old Testament. And it's interesting that Solomon's purpose for asking was this. He says, I want the ability to defend people's rights. That's the Hebrew word mishpat. It's people's God-given rights. He said, I want to defend others with this knowledge of good and evil. That's a very big part of the narrative as well. And God gives him this fruit. And I think it's interesting. I think it's really interesting that all of this started in Genesis with a woman called life who looks and takes, and then she gives to the human and the hum human gets out of relationship. It's this love affair between a man and a woman, a human and life. The human didn't listen to God. The human listened to life. And the wisest man on earth in the Old Testament gets the, the knowledge of good and evil and he begins to write a narrative about a woman. Listen to what Proverbs 1 is. Listen to this woman. He says, wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. Notice these words because I'm going to show them to you again. She shouts in the street. Remember that word street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. How long, O oh naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. The wisest man who got to eat from a, a tree of knowledge of good and evil is now writing about another woman. Her name in Hebrew is Chokmah. That's the Hebrew word for wisdom. Remember that Hava was life in Hebrew, which is the Hava got translated to the word Eve. You can listen to Chava or you can listen to Chokmah. There's two women now, and the story is developing. Okay, which woman are we going to flirt with? Which woman are we going to listen to? Whose voice are we going to partake in? And Chokmah, wisdom, this woman in Proverbs, written by the wisest man on earth, 
says that she's shouting in the square. She's screaming out, who's going to listen to me? Who's going to partner with me? That's all in Proverbs. The entire book of Proverbs is about a woman who is named Wisdom. Lady Wisdom is what theologians call her. But listen to this other narrative. Remember I told you to collect the words of shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. Well, Slomo writes another story, Song of Solomon. Listen to what he says. Now, you know, this, you know the story of Song of Solomon. It's about a man and a woman. It's this love affair. They're, they're desperately in love with one another. They have eyes only for each other. Listen to what he says in Song of Solomon 3. It says, by night on my bed, I sought the one that I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares, and I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me and said, have you seen the one that I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one that I loved. I held him and would not let him go until I brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. The whole book of Song of Solomon, I want to challenge you. Um, I'm not going to say that it's wrong. It's just I want to add another layer to it. I know we've always heard that Song of Solomon is written as a type of Christ and the church. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I just want to challenge you to look a layer deeper than that. Remember, this started in a garden between a man and a woman, a human and life. And life looks and takes. And looking and taking caused a whole host of problems. There's other people that partnered with life. The sons of God looked and took the women. Pharaoh looked at Sarah and took her. The Israelites looked at Saul and said, we want him as a king, and they took him. Life never gets us where we want to go. That's what we've developed in the narrative. But now the wisest man who got to eat from the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, by God's terms, he didn't look and take, he asked. He's now writing of another woman. And he shows this love affair in Song of Solomon between a man and a woman. Is it Christ in the church or is it us and wisdom? Is it all of us humans and wisdom? Well, we've already seen in Proverbs that there's a woman who's crying out in the streets. She's in the squares and she's saying, who will listen to me? Who's going to listen to my voice? And then he connects it because the same author wrote both books and we've collected the words and he's drawing a parallel here. Song of Solomon is showing that there is a woman desperately longing for another Adam, another human, to partner with her. And what I felt this afternoon when I was praying about this call, as I was just praying and God dropped this on me, he said, my spirit is the spirit of wisdom. He said, and I am screaming, this is the word God gave me, he said, I am screaming from heaven to this generation to partner with my wisdom and stop listening to life. Our, your generation is going to be completely annihilated if you listen to life and life alone. There is something that will get you to where you cannot go by listening to life. You will notice that when you read Song of Solomon, it is all garden imagery. It's in a vineyard. They're eating fruit together. They're under an apple tree. They're all, it's, it's this garden imagery because when you listen to wisdom, she gets you back to the garden that we lost access to. Wisdom gets you in the kingdom. The voice of politics is drowning out the voice of wisdom right now. The voice of red versus blue, uh, an elephant versus a donkey is drowning out the voice of wisdom. The voice of, of cultures, black versus white, uh, red versus blue, cop against cop, vaccine or no vaccine, mask or no mask, all of this is trying to drown out a sweet, still, small voice that is wise. We have got to be a wise generation. We cannot just look and take anymore. We cannot be a generation that is known for looking and taking. Well, I see a good opportunity. This college opened up. Does that mean you take the opportunity, though? What does wisdom say? Our generation is enthralled with, is it a heaven or hell issue? I want to ask you, is it a wisdom issue? I don't want you to look and say, oh, I can do this. It's not a heaven or hell. It may not be. Is it wise? Is it wise? I, was, I feel this way. I feel like we've gotten to the place that Joseph got to. Joseph had no Bible. There was no Torah for Joseph. And there was no law that told him he could not sleep with Potiphar's wife. 
he looked at it and said, this isn't wise. This isn't a good thing to do. There was nothing telling him he couldn't. And yet there was a, something in him that said, there was a voice crying out in the street that said, it's not wise. We don't have Bible for Netflix. We have wisdom that talks about the principles that are against Netflix. We don't, we don't have Bible for, you know, what we should like or dislike. We have wisdom that says, how is this going to make you look to the lost? We don't have certain scripture. We don't have a scripture for vaccines. We don't have a scripture for masks. We don't have a scripture. The whole Bible was, was based around a monarchy. We didn't have a democracy in the Bible. We don't, we don't know, you know what to do about voting. We need to sit down and we need to listen to the voice of wisdom and say, is this wise? We shouldn't be looking through there and say, well, the Bible doesn't give me a list of yay or nay. No, no, I shouldn't. Or yes, I can. We need to say, is this wise? There is a voice screaming from heaven right now, and it is begging a generation to listen to her. Are you going to, as humans, are you going to flirt with life? Are you going to listen to what life is telling? Because here's what I'm telling you. Life will lie to you every single time. Life is going to say, look, that's a great opportunity. Take it. Look, that's a, that's a wonderful uh, thing that you can do over here. Take it for yourself. What does wisdom say? Wisdom was screaming at the nation of Israel saying, you've got a king. You've got a king. He is God of gods, king of kings. You've got one. You don't need a Saul. And they said, no, he, all these people around us, read the story. All these other nations have kings. We should have one too. Look around us. We should be a proper nation. Let us have a king. What is life telling you that looks good? What can you take? And Paul says this. He says, all things are lawful. You can, there's, there's things that you can take. But they're not all wise. They're not expedient. You need to partner with wisdom. This voice, she is crying out. And I could not shake this in prayer this afternoon as I was preparing for this call. God just kept rolling it over my spirit. He said, I am screaming from heaven right now for a generation to partner with me. Now watch, we notice that this all took place with a human, right? A human that listened to life. Life was a looker and a taker. This was not a chauvinistic passage. This isn't saying that men are better than women. This is biblical narrative. This is how the narrative works. It's showing that humans have a problem with life and humans don't know how to listen to God over life. Started with an Adam. Isn't it interesting though that the New Testament opens up with three wise men bowing to a baby? That's Who does that? Wise men do that. Only wise men can bow down to a, a vulnerable king, grown men who could easily be kings over a baby. And wise men said, I will follow this vulnerable child right here. This is the king. Only wisdom. Wisdom looks foolish to the world. Life will say, wisdom's not wise. Because sometimes wisdom will scream at you and say, you need to give everything you've got in your bank account to that missionary because it would be wise for he or she to go overseas than it would be for you to buy a car that you don't need right now. You see? But, but life will say, look, you owe it to yourself to buy a brand new Mercedes or whatever. And what you could do is say, no, it might be wiser to buy a Hyundai and give the rest to a missionary so that they can have a moped and they can go and put themselves on the line so that they can work in the mission that God's called them to. You see how sometimes life says, you deserve this. You've worked hard. Look, take. Wisdom bows down to babies. That's what wise men do. And this second Adam begins to grow and mature. He would go by the name of Jesus. And Paul would call him the second Adam. Daniel would say that he was the son of man. Son of man is a Hebrew idiom, by the way, just to kind of help you. It doesn't mean that his daddy was God and he was the son, you know, little son Jesus. Son of man is a, just an idiomatic phrase. Whenever you see son of anything in Hebrew culture, it just means that you're of the order or classification of that. For example, in the Old Testament, when they were called sons of the prophets, their daddies weren't prophets. They were of the order of the prophets. I am licensed with the United Pentecost Church International. I'm A.J. Holloway, son of the UPC. 
it's because I'm of the order of the United Pentecostal Church. Uh, you all are, you know, Emily and Hope, you are the daughters of CMI. It's just, that's all that means. So son of man just meant he was a human. That's all that means. He was a human. And there's a new human coming through town that goes into a wilderness and he's offered all these things. Look, a kingdom. Look, look what you can have. And Jesus shows us, no, I don't look and take. I'm a far better human than the first Adam. And this whole thing started in a garden. We see that there's lovers yearning for one another, a human and wisdom in Song of Songs. It's all taking place in a garden. And this whole thing ends in a garden. Jesus goes to a garden and he says, ah, I would love to not partake of this fruit that's in this cup. That's, you should be drinking this fruit. You're the one who plucked it from the tree. Humans, you deserve to drink from this fruit. If it's possible, I'd like for this cup to pass from me, this bitter fruit that you pluck from the tree. Nevertheless, though, I'm not a looker and taker. I'm going to do what is wise. It's going to look foolish. This is, what, this is what Paul's talking about, by the way. It's the foolishness of preaching. It looks foolish to everybody else. He said that the cross looked foolish to the unsaved. Because who goes to a cross and dies? He says, you deserve this, this bitter fruit in this cup. But nevertheless, I'm not a looker and a taker. I'm going to give my life. And you notice that it was life that got human away from the tree, away from the garden. And now Jesus would lay down his life. He doesn't not, he just doesn't listen to life. He also gives his life. And through the giving of his life, he offered us life. You see how amazing the biblical narrative is when you read it as the literature that it's presenting us to? He goes and John says this, Jesus is hanging from the cross. He looks and he says, give me that sponge with the vinegar, vinegar in it. Vinegar was a cheap knockoff wine that was served at the end of a wedding. Okay. Now we've already established because we collect words. Remember in Hebrew, John has already showed us that Jesus removed the shame from a bride, a woman at the beginning of his narrative at the wedding of Canaan by what? Turning water to wine. By turning water to wine, he removes the shame from his bride. The governor gets up, he drinks the wine. He says, you have saved the best for last. We've collected these words. So now we're expecting the last things to be better. So Jesus is hanging on the cross. The chapter is getting ready to close. He requests the cheap wine that was supposed to be served at the end of the wedding. He drinks it and he turns wine to water. They pierce his side, out comes water. He recycled this fruit that you and I plucked from the tree. He absorbed it into himself and he turned wine back into water and he removed our sin. And he also removed our shame as his new bride. We're the new Eve that was born out of Calvary. You and I are the church. We're the bride. Are we wise or are we fools? This is the question. What kind of bride are we? Are we a foolish bride? Well, remember this whole thing in Proverbs and Song of Solomon there was a voice crying in the streets. Well, Jesus gives a little parable of five wise and five foolish virgins. And there was a voice crying in the streets that said, the bridegroom cometh. And the wise got up, dressed themselves, trimmed their lamps, and they went to Jesus. We are in the last hours, guys. We need to be wise. In your P7 groups, you need to be wise. You need to use wisdom. Guys, don't be in the room alone with a girl. That could completely destroy your P7 group. Young ladies, don't let some guy completely run your emotions. Don't let them tell you these words. They're, they're not always true. He's probably trying to get something out of you. Be wise. You know, be wise in what you post. What you post can completely destroy a soul that's trying to come into the kingdom. Be wise in what you do. Be wise in what you watch. What kind of bride are you? There is a voice crying. The bridegroom is coming. Are you wise or are you foolish? We are in the last hours and the Lord just keeps pouring this on me. He says, tell them I'm screaming at them from the streets to be wise in this last hour. All of that, that second Adam, he fills us with his spirit. And you and I have, according to 1 Corinthians 12, we can have the gift of a word of wisdom. So this started in a garden. Jesus conquered the garden. Now watch where it ends. 
Listen to this. In Revelations chapter 22, verse 2, remember we've collected words so far. In the middle of its streets and on the either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Guys, there is a tree of life that you and I should be sitting under. We can only get access to it if we're wise. If we are wise, we will listen to the gospel. When we respond to the gospel, we will live holy, sanctified lives. We will be wise in everything that we say and do. And when we do that, we go back to the garden. Song of Songs has proven that to us. If we will listen to wisdom, we can go back to the garden. Now we can pluck from the tree of life. And you know what happens when you pluck from trees of life and you consume that? What comes out of your mouth is healing for the nations. What are you saying to the broken right now? What are you saying to the broken people in your youth groups? What are you saying to the people in your P7 groups? What are you saying to the young black man who is completely distraught right now over everything that's going on in this culture? What life is saying? What do you say to the young lady who is paranoid, full of anxiety right now? Should I get the shot? Should I not get the shot? I didn't get a graduation because of the pandemic. What is the wise bride saying? Is a foolish bride saying buck up son just get a little better other thing is going to be better the lord's coming or is the wise person sitting with them weeping with those that weep and rejoicing with those that rejoice we need a wise generation i'll tell you where wisdom isn't found i haven't found a lot of wisdom and i'm not preaching against anything i'm just telling you my observation i've not found a lot of wisdom in the news i've not found a lot of wisdom on social media I have not found a lot of wisdom on Netflix. I've not found a lot of wisdom in those areas. I have found wisdom in one place and one place alone. It is in the word of God. Every time I go to that book, I find my answer. Every time I turn its pages, I discover what I need to do right now. Every time I turn through those pages, I know how I should respond to somebody who's hurting and broken. And when I partner with that with prayer, I can feast from the tree of life and I can pluck from the fruit that I have full access to as a Holy Ghost filled, sanctified believer, not by my works, but by his spirit working in me so that I can take fruit and I can heal those around me because I have access to a tree. This started in a garden. We lost the garden. Jesus got it back by conquering a garden. And you and I have access to a garden yet again, if we're wise. Listen to what it says. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve with him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Well, remember, if you've read Revelation, it says that people are going to be marked with a beast. Well, there's another mark. There's another mark. You can reject the mark of a beast. That's a whole nother topic I can talk hours on, by the way. But there is another mark. There's the mark of the beast and there's the mark of the least. Are you going to be the least of these? That's what we need. That is what is wise. Life says, pursue greatness. Make a name for yourself. Pursue the, the platforms. Pursue the limelights. That's what you deserve. You pray a lot. You fast a lot. You are holy. You're sanctified. You deserve that opportunity. In fact, you probably deserve it more than so-and-so who's up there right now. That's what life will tell you. But wisdom says, Where's the hurting? Where's the broken? Where's the person that I can go and sit with? And I don't have to tell any of you any of this. You're already doing this. You're in the P7 groups. You're in the CMI chapters. You're teaching Bible studies. I want to encourage you that you are right there at the tree of life and you are doing what God has called you to do because you are not marked by a beast. You've been marked by the least. It's to the least of these. It's when you become least is when you're the wisest. It is time to pursue the lowly places. Water, does not water itself show us that it seeks out the lowly and it pulls up on that? Well, when there's an overflow of the spirit being poured out, it always pulls up on what is first lowly and it begins to saturate that person. And when we can lower ourselves, the, the spirit pulls up on us and we are full of life and we can minister at a capacity that we could never do by partnering with life. So I'm going to end this right here. Setting before you is two options. You can choose Chava, which is life. You can partner with her. She's out there. She's got a very provocative voice. She's going to tell you a lot of sweet things. There's going to be a lot of good opportunities. She'll, she will. She'll take you places. But when you get there, she'll leave you there too. Or you could listen to Chokmah, this wisdom 
she also will take you places. But when she brings you there, you'll stay there. The difference between these, these two, there's no life over here. Life looked and took. You notice that something interesting takes place in Genesis. A woman called life did not feast from a tree of life. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Life felt, I can do this all in myself. I am life. I, I have no need for his life. And notice what Jesus does. He says, I will lay down my life. And that would be, lo and behold, what he would call us to do. When you partner with Hokmah by resisting your life, laying it down, not only will she take you somewhere, but she will sustain you there and keep you there. You will be granted access to heaven through wisdom. I'm imploring you, please partner with wisdom. Sit down before gut reaction responding to a situation, stop. This will be invaluable help right here. Stop for a moment and, and say this, is this wise? How will this affect those around me? Is this going to cause problems for other people coming to him? If it is, even though I can do it, I'm not going to because it's not wise. Before you speak, think, is it wise? Before you post, think, is this wise? Before you go onto the search bar side of Instagram, stop, is this wise? Wisdom will always bring you to the tree of life. I love you guys. I have the utmost confidence in all of you. If you will just partner with wisdom, I would, I would just say this to you. Spend the next two months, get you a good study Bible, and go through Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And while you're at it, in Jewish culture, Job is part of their wisdom literature. Job balances out Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Because you might think to yourself, oh, if I do everything Proverbs says, all good things will happen to me. It's a book of Proverbs, not promises, by the way. Bad things still happen, even though you're wise. I am a testimony of that. But Job says, I'm still going to be faithful because that's wise. Even though I didn't get what I wanted, I'll still be faithful to God because the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. Sit with that text, read it, meditate upon it, eat the bread and digest the bread, read the word and meditate on the word. I, I really, I would like to challenge you guys to read through those four books in the next two months and just let it speak to you. Let that voice in the streets called life scream at you. I love you guys. I don't want to take a ton of time and I don't want to take advantage of your time. I pray that this ministers to you and I pray that you see the Bible in a whole new light. And I pray sincerely that you partner with a far greater voice than the voice of life. Brother Holloway, I want to say thank you for that. That's, that's so powerful. I, I, I want to just real quickly share an experience I had this last week in regards to what you're saying. We, we, we felt the spirit and we got called over to a, an individual's house. And um, this person was, was, was filled with many spirits. And one of the first things they started to do is they began to cry out, I am God. Mm. And they began to say, I want you to look at my eyes. And then they began to point to the to the television that was across the room and they said the answers in the tv and they began to go and this this was just the start and they began to go through all of this different stuff as these these spirits begin to manifest and i just want to reiterate what you already said and just and just say what what we take in and what we absorb what we do with our time is so is so much more powerful than we than we really know yeah th th thank you again brother that was that was awesome thank right, you so great. much I thank you all for letting me do it. It's humbling. It really is. Well, does anybody have any, any questions or, any, or anything like that as we wrap this up? Got any Hebrew nerds on here? <laughs> I love the Hebrew language. It's the ugliest language out of all of them, man. You're like It really is. I don't like speaking it because it's ugly, but man, it's, it's beautiful when you read it, <laughs> what it's saying, but it's not fun to say.
Are you being you can, Luke, you can speak Hebrew. <laughs> Come on. Everybody hockey you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that, that about wraps it up. Thank you again, brother. That, that means a lot. So thank you. All right, Emily. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. So all right, yes, sir. Um and we're gonna go ahead and kind of transition into connect point um for you guys who want to stay on. Um so give it a few minutes and kind of transition over into that. Thank you, Brother Holloway. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yes, sir. Y'all have fun. I've got three screaming babies that are ready for bedtime. So <laughs>